two, one, and we are recording episode 282 with Mr. Fred Burton, author of Ghost Confessions of a Counter-Terrorist Agent, which I'm trying to stop doing this. How about you introduce yourself first before I go on a rant? Well, thank you, Tommy, for having me on. Uh, I'm yes, Fred sir. Burton. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. And um, so... I'm sure you're aware of Skunk Works, right? Lockheed Martin, Skunk Works. Mm -hmm. And then the original head of it, Kelly Johnson, Clarence Kelly Johnson, and then his successor, the a little more well-known, maybe, Ben Rich, who designed the F-117. He wrote in his book, Skunk Works, about how Kelly Johnson had, they would bring him to Langley or bring him up to the Pentagon. And he would be the only one that they would let in, you know, extremely compartmentalized. And he would come back and he'd be like, Kelly never told us what was going on, but he did tell us that behind the curtain, the world was about 70 to 75% worse than the news <laughs> let you know, let you know. And getting through your book, that's, which by the way, everybody listening will be in the description, sticking in the top comment. And as always, I do not recommend bad books. So go get it. It's, um, that's what it made me think of. I was like, the world is 75% worse than my feeble little mind can know. Would you say that's accurate? I think uh, Mr. Johnson painted a very fair picture, Tommy, uh, you know, concerning what takes place in the dark world, you know, behind the scenes, uh, you know, the sheer scope of threats that uh, the United States intelligence community just manages on a given day. I think most people would be shocked to, to understand that scope. Yeah. And, and probably from a psychological perspective, it's, it's a good thing, uh, but you know I think we've certainly turned the corner in our post 9/11 world, and things uh, are much better on that that front with just the ability to to track and neutralize and monitor global threats. Yeah, yeah, and it it seems it, two points on that. One is it seems like it's almost um, it seems like there's almost like a shared like a shared burden, right? It's like if it's a hundred pounds and a hundred people, everybody gets one pound. It seems like by saving the, 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 the mass consciousness from like knowing how bad the world is, it's not like an even, you just, you know, there's no, there's no free lunches. You don't just get to cut out that. It seems like it sits more heavily on those who do know. And that's kind of what you got into in your book is that, it's stuff you know that no one else knows. And you're like, how do I, you know, how can I do this? Like the, the luxury, what was it? The luxury of sitting on the train or, the, or sitting on the plane. They don't know what's going on. They're going to work, going to the diner. And in your mind, it's like, we got to protect this person because there's like a credible threat out there. Would you say that's true? I, I do. I, I think though, uh, in many ways, Tommy, when, I was in the business, uh, in some days it seems like yesterday, but it, it was a long time ago. And, you know, from a national priority perspective, terrorism just wasn't, although we had certainly been hit hard in, in you know, beginning in the 70s uh, on up into the 90s. So there, there was no shortage of catastrophic events. Now, in, in fairness, the bulk of those events happened overseas. Mm -hmm. And we did not have the internet or the 24 by seven news cycle. So it, it wasn't constantly in your face, you know? So for example, uh, just for the benefit uh, as, as a student of history who has lived through a lot of this is, take for example, the uh, 1979 uh, embassy takeover in Tehran under the Carter administration. That same day, our United States ambassador to Afghanistan was kidnapped and assassinated that same day. Now, think of all the social media and talking heads and news uh, coverage of the horrific events in Benghazi, which I also wrote a book about. Mm -hmm. But picture that today where you have a U.S. embassy seizure with American diplomats held hostage, and then you have a United States ambassador kidnapped and murdered. And so it was just a different era. Yeah. Or that, yeah, that was almost, that was almost a norm. Right. And it's, do you think you, so you said post 9 11 world, do you think that, um, do you think that it's become again from my, you know, 
my 30 year old biology degree mind of all my expertise in the dark world, right? Do you think it, how, is it easier or more difficult with, with just the way technology is progressing? Everyone can have a burner phone. Everyone can encrypt this. You can post in, I think ISIS did this where they post images on Instagram, but there was actually metadata inside of it. And if you like inverted it and then overlapped it, you could get coordinates or you could get keywords. And it was, but then at the same time we have things like, well, we've had them forever, but the NSA, we have things like the Utah data center where they can kind of crack these codes and they seem to be all, all seeing, all knowing. Do you think it's easier, more difficult, or is it just a different kind of difficulty to uh, thwart these events? Well, I think the, the United States intelligence community with our allied partners, the five eyes mm -hmm. that, collectively we've done a wonderful job and so there's an order of magnitude when you start talking about difficulty with just the processing of intelligence information meaning on my watch your haystack was much smaller because your means of collection was not as good okay today you the challenge is you have an overwhelming amount of information so where do you pluck out that needle from that haystack and how do you make sense of everything that you're collecting from the open source to the dark web to uh, intelligence chatter to liaison intelligence information that mi6 might be providing you or the israeli mossad or the jordanian gid the list just goes on and on and on now having said that there are thousands of more personnel devoted to this program from a counterterrorism perspective at the National Counterterrorism Center. You have the Joint Terrorism Task Forces around the country. You have DHS fusion centers in every capital in America. So the amount of eyes and the amount of resources devoted to just vetting threats is so far ahead of where we used to be in the 80s and the 90s and you know and quite frankly even the bombing in oklahoma city at the federal building and the first world trade center terrorist attack and the shooting at the front gate of the cia you know none of those events even moved the needle from what we're seeing today in our post 9 11 you know environment yeah yeah, it seems. Yeah, it seems like that's the. And I think there's. I cannot remember his name, but there was a guy that proposed a system right before nine eleven, and then it got funding right after nine eleven. TIA, Total Information Awareness. But that's what he was talking about. Was kind of what you said. It's like it was kind of easier because your haystack was smaller, but it didn't necessarily mean the haystack was smaller. It was just that you could only grab so many pieces of hay. Right. It's like the drunk man looking for his watch under the streetlight because that's the only place where he could see. It's like it may well. Not yeah, and, and also, Tommy, you had, um, remember from a national priority perspective, the, the whole intelligence community was pretty much put together for the Cold War, yeah. meaning to combat the Russians yeah. and the Chinese to a lesser degree during that time period, but they were always out there. So uh, the entire mission was one of, on, on a national priority perspective, primarily focused on counterintelligence not counterterrorism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it, there does seem to be that adaptation, right? It's, it begins with uh, the CIA in 47 and it starts as this entire, we just finished a cataclysmic world war that ended with the vaporization of two cities. And it's like, we get the CIA and it comes in and then the whole thing, it's, it's that James Bond, it's like every, there's a nuclear, it, there's nuclear bombs ready to go, there's 70,000 of them, they're on ICBMs designed by Nazis, these things are multi-megatons, and it's just this like, the, the dial is up to 11, and then all of a sudden it kind of switches into this 9-11 world where all of a sudden it's like we're fighting these guys with AKs and sandals with goats, and it's this weird... It's this weird, it's Mike Tyson, and all of a sudden he's put into a, I don't know, he's put into like a, a kickboxing fight. 
And it's like, what, like, what, what exactly do you, he has all the power. He has all the, the motivation and the ability to work, but it's like, he can't throw a haymaker. Right. And it's this weird, it's this, but you kind of talked about how it did bleed over though. Right. Because with that plane being shot down in India and Pakistan, I never knew how close that was to that. That was a Cuban missile crisis of sorts. It really was. You're talking about the, um, August 1988 plane crash, yeah. which killed President Zia of Pakistan, uh, U.S. Ambassador Arnie Rayful, uh, a two-star U.S. Army Brigadier General, General mm-hmm. Wassum, mm-hmm. and pretty much the uh, equivalent of the entire uh, Pakistani uh, cabinet went down on one yeah. flight. And, yeah. and that event um, is, uh, was a geopolitical significant case and the likes of which you would have to dial it back to the Bay of Pigs with Kennedy and then fast forward to 88 with the Zia plane crash and it was in a very volatile time period in the history of not only national security but just covert action, uh, geopolitics, you had the Soviet withdrawal of Afghanistan, we had been fighting this war that actually began in 1979 in Afghanistan. So you have this pivotal event in 88, and here we are still in Afghanistan, although uh, President Trump has has somewhat drawn down. So, uh, you know, the thing about that, Tommy, is, you know, big wars start in small places. Yeah, yeah, right. Archduke Franz Ferdinand, just getting getting popped on a a motorcade ride, right? Right. It's... That was terrifying, though. Yeah, it's like the same pressure of popping a Coke can VX gas. And it's like, oh, my Lord. I actually laughed when you're talking about that guy. And he laughed and said, were there actually snakes? I will never tell. <laughs> I will never tell. It's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, what, what, you're, what Tommy is referring to in the book yeah. is I, I talk about um, the Random House who published that uh, in – now it seems like a lifetime ago with all the different books I've written since then. That was my first book, uh, Random House, published in 2008. And uh, we talked about uh, just the experiences of having to deal, that, deal with an international investigation of that scope and magnitude. And, yeah. and uh, we had an individual from the uh, Pakistani uh, Air Force and Intelligence Service that we had nicknamed Cheech from yeah. Cheech and Chong. Yeah. And, and he was quite the character and, and, you know, looking back on this, Tommy, I mean, you said you're 30. I was probably all of uh, 25 or 26 on that case. And yeah. And, you know, I, I was overwhelmed and, you know, quite frankly, uh, too inexperienced in, in retrospect to have been put in that position. But you know, that was the nature of the job in those days, which just shows you also the evolution of how far we've come. I mean, there were, there were many cases that not only did I investigate literally by myself with like an old school Polaroid camera, uh, a notepad where you're taking notes, and uh, it, it's something like out of a, you know, a bad 1970s dragnet episode uh, for those of you that, that may be familiar with that series, if not Google it. But, yeah. um, and that's just how we rolled in those days. And, and so when you're dealing in an international case, the complexity is never easy. Meaning, uh, and this is another thing that most people don't understand, Tommy, that if you have a something as simple as a homicide or a bombing inside the United States, you control the geography, Mm -hmm. you put up the crime scene tape, and for the most part, you get very capable first responders in the United States. And if anything, you can just wait until the feds show up, whether that be ATF or the FBI or whoever. Overseas, it's a different operating environment. You have to request permission from the host country to even come in to investigate. They have to welcome you in. And so whenever we were responding to cases, literally you could be a days, a 24 to 48 hour lag and just getting there Mm -hmm. after you got all the clearances. And then once you were there, 
it was not unusual uh, to have the crime, a crime scene that's been totally uh, already examined uh, or there has been no crime scene control whatsoever. So you're trying to make sense of this puzzle with perhaps at times 20 to 30 percent of the data. And so it, it's, it's just a different way of operating. And then especially if you're operating in certain countries that are very problematic, meaning uh, if you're in, in locations such as Pakistan uh, or Sub-Saharan Africa mm -hmm. or certain locations in the Middle East where there's just not the same standard of U.S. investigative oversight like you would see on CSI today. You know, yeah. uh, th there wasn't any CSI in those days that, that could help when you're overseas. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like the difference in like changing a tire on your car in the driveway and changing a tire on the car on, on the lunar rover, right? Same <laughs> thing, just different geography makes a world of a difference, right? Yeah, it it certainly does, and and you know, so for the most part, a lot of times in in some of your international investigations, you have to uh, accept whatever your local counterparts, your local nationals will allow you to see, to visit, to investigate who you talk to. And a lot of these cases are very politically driven, meaning uh, when you look at some of the cases where we would be brought in to help, uh, you know, you had a significant amount of, of um, diplomacy and foreign policy kind of ramifications with regarding what you might find as a conclusion. Yeah. So the, you know, the challenges were always there in, in that international environment and, and quite frankly, they still exist today. Yeah. Now, do you think you talked to, towards the end about, you know, take, you know, exit stage left, like you took your opportunity to get out and kind of live more your life and, you know, be in your, your children's life. Do you, do you constantly think like, cause I've heard this with, with other and like Joe Rogan, he had on Andy Stump, who was a guy in SEAL Team 6. And he talks about when he was first out, he'd be watching the news and it's, oh, they recaptured this city, that city. We did so much to get it. And like, as the years have gone on, like as the, like the episodes has gone on, and he did one in 2016, did one in 2018, 2020, you can see him change to where it's less of like, we got to do this and I'm living vicariously through it. And I'm being a backseat driver to... He's like, now I live out in like God's country in America and I'm teaching my son how to ski. And he's like, at a certain point, it's just like, I did my part. I served my country, but you know, it, you know, you have to also take care of yourself because no one else is going to do that for you. Do you, do you think that you kind of had that same arc where, you know, you leave it to the younger guys, this is my exit, you know, or do you still have those thoughts of like, did I do everything I could have done? should I still be in there or is it, do you trust them that, Hey, they got the wheel. They got it. It's good. Well, I think Tommy, and I think that's an excellent question. I, I know that, uh, uh, you know, I've gone back to subsequent cases that I've worked to write about them because I feel that uh, there wasn't a lot of closure. For example, um, my last book uh, is called Beirut Rules, which is a story of the kidnapping and murder of the only CIA station chief. Now, when I was back as an agent, uh, I worked that case and we tried very hard to find former CIA station chief Bill Buckley mm -hmm. when he was kidnapped by Hezbollah, although we did not know that at the time. And it, it, gives me a, a, a level of peace to be able to go back and talk about those cases and closure, but more importantly for the families of the victims, mm -hmm. you know, the loved ones. And, and we were so overwhelmed with these kinds of cases back in the day that I do think it's a good thing, not only for me, but also for the sake of history to write about some of these cases. So folks are, are not forgotten. Yeah. Uh, for example, Bill Buckley was a, a, a hero. Uh, he had fought in the Korean War. He mm -hmm. had fought in Vietnam. He was one of Kennedy's first Green Berets. Uh, hell, he had received uh, 
two silver silver stars for bravery on the battlefield in two different wars. And then after the embassy bombing in 83 in Beirut, he volunteers to go to Lebanon to stand up the intelligence mission for the CIA after everybody had been killed. And, and so, and then he's subsequently taken hostage, which was his worst nightmare. And we were saddled to try to find him in a day when we had very limited technology, we had limited satellite capability, we had limited human intelligence capabilities in a place like Beirut, Lebanon. So for me to be able to go back and, and write about that case uh, is uh, a good thing to do. Uh, now, uh, before I wrote that story, I reached out to the family Mm -hmm. and told them what I was going to do. And I also reached out to the CIA and asked for their help and uh, received help by both uh, to help me put that story together. Because I think some of these stories from that time frame, Tommy, need to be told because they're, folks like Bill Buckley are in many ways forgotten heroes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it also kind of, to put it bluntly, it kind of sucks, right? Aside from the obvious, but it kind of sucks because you're talking about, you're like, if we could just find out, like, you know, before they, you know, get them, is like, we could send Delta in. And you're like, Delta would just, <laughs> you said, you're like, these guys would just get wiped out by Delta. They wouldn't know, they wouldn't know what was happening until it was over. And it kind of makes me think of uh, Kurt Muse, right? It was Operation Acid Gambit in, was I think, Panama? Like and they went. They knew he was there. I've had the I've had the door breacher from Delta Force at the Modelo Prison. I've had him on this podcast several times, Dale Comstock. But he talks about it, and it's like once they knew where he was, it was just like you threw him in there. And the way Dale describes it, he's like Delta flows like water. Like they will find the cracks. They will seep in. They go through, and it really is just pop, 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 and everyone's what happened? And all of a sudden, like everyone around you is dead, except the guy you don't want dead, right? You grab him, throw him in a flak jacket and bring him out. But yeah, there's like, but first you have to find him. And there is that disappointment of like, we have, I mean, we have Delta or Devgru, we have the hand of God, but you don't know where to put it. And well, that is disappointing. Yeah, it, it was extraordinarily frustrating. I mean, we had, we figured in those days and I was working out of um, assigned to the CIA's hostage location task force at the time. We figured if we could find the CIA station chief, we could find the almost 20 other Americans and Westerners that were being held captive at the time. Yeah. Heck, we had a Catholic priest, we had an ABC journalist, we had uh, academics from Beirut University College, American University Beirut. We had Americans suffering our challenge was we just simply could not find them. And it's, it was an intelligence problem that, that literally drove us crazy, but we just lacked the human, the human intelligence to be able to locate them. Yeah. And if we had located him or them at any specific location to your point, uh, Tommy, I have no doubt that uh, our special operations community uh, predominantly Delta or SEAL Team 6 could have gotten the job done uh, and, and rescued them. Our challenge was, it's your classic intelligence problem, we just lacked the, the ground truth, the intelligence information to pinpoint where he was on any given day. And so you're certainly not going to commit uh, blood and treasure on a goose hunt yeah, uh, in in a place like Beirut during that time period, and it, we would have probably ended up with more hostages on our hands if if we had tried. So, yeah, it was a dark moment for us um, for many years, and and uh, you know I can still recall vividly when we first learned that that Bill had died in captivity. We were actually debriefing another hostage in yeah. Wiesbaden, Germany, and you know, literally you could have sucked the air out of the room because yeah. we felt that we had failed. It, it yeah. was a sense of overwhelming failure of mission. And then, you know, we kind of picked ourselves up and said, well, 
we need to bring him home and we need to bring him and Colonel Rich Higgins, Rich Higgins home, who also had been kidnapped and, and held. So we, we managed to do that uh, a few years later uh, to, to bring them back for proper burial and so forth. But, you know, during that time period, it was probably looking back on my career, one of our, my biggest failures. Um, and, you know, I think about it a lot. I, I still do. Yeah. Yeah. You, 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 and that's one thing I kind of noted in the book was there were a lot of things where it was just understood. It's like, I'm not sleeping tonight. Right. And it's, I don't know if this makes me weird or maybe I just identify with you, but like, that's one thing I kind of got is like, whenever I think like TWA 800, like the one, I remember like the one thing I thought was like, or I remember like, you know, nine eleven. I was 11 years old. I remember thinking like how, you know, how long is the fall? Cause I love skyscrapers. I was like, how long is the fall from the 92nd story? And it's, when you talk about these plane crashes or explosions or depressurizations or regaining consciousness, again, maybe I'm just weird or maybe not, but that's what my mind has always gone to is like, well, hold on. Like, but did they wake up? Were they there? And it's like, yeah, two minutes. Some of them know, knew for two minutes and you can find them holding crosses or holding hands. And it's, that's the kind of stuff that, yeah, it's, you know, as bad as 9-11 was, there's also a part of it. It's just like, okay, it's explosions, it's fire, right? It's nothing you haven't seen in a movie. It's people jumping out and, you know, holding hands and in ties and business skirts following a quarter mile in New York. And it's like, that's kind of what sticks with me. And that's, I, I think that put a sort of a human touch on it more. It was like, that's all you could think about it, right? It wasn't just the cold face, like another day at the office. Like I deal with this every day. No, it was just like, I just laid there and was like, I just, I couldn't stop thinking about that. Like, what were they wondering? What were they terrified? Did they accept their fate? And it's, to me, that's what kind of made it hit home more. It was like, yeah, like you're, you're still a person. Like Mr. Burton's still a person. You're a badass, but you're a person, right? And it's, that's kind of what got to me. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, I understand completely, uh, you know, those feelings. I, I get it. And, and um, you know, there's certain things you can't unsee. You know, we, we made, um, you know, we tried to do, you know, the way I tried to rationalize this, or I, I, maybe I, I have very selfishly over the years, is, is realize that uh, we, we really did try to do everything that we could have at that time period to get to a man like Bill Buckley, uh, but we just couldn't. Uh, we we failed. We ran out of time, and um, you know those are the kind of real world problems that happen every day in this business. And and you know for me, just the ability to look back and and to memo memorialize his life with a story of of um, that, uh, you know, that, that's a good thing to do in my mind, um, to let other generations know that, that um, this was the kind of person he was, like so many that just ran towards danger. Yeah. And uh, that's what that community is always about. You know, yeah. they're, whether you're the firefighters rushing to the Twin Towers uh, or you're Bill Buckley rushing to Beirut, uh, you know, those are different kinds of people, you know, that rush towards danger. Yeah. Yeah. And kind of on like a, a side note, that's one thing I've always thought about is like, isn't that like the, isn't that like one of the, like the true tragedies of war is it almost seems like it's selectively breeding out those genes, World War One, World War Two, And it's like, you're almost removing those, those who have a backbone, those who, you know, run towards the fire it almost seems like that's like, that's an especially uh, almost demonic thing about warfare and, and, and murder is like, those are the people you wipe out and the ones that survive are the ones that don't run towards the fire. But yeah, it's so kind of to do a 180. You talked about something that I've often thought about with counterterrorism is that you have to be right 100% of the time. They only have to be right a non-zero percent of the time, right? That's Curtis LeMay's doctrine. A bomber will always get through. And in the age of atomic bombs, 
that's all we need. You can, we'll send 10,000 B29s. You can take out 9,999. One of those suckers gets through, we can vaporize your city. He, I think he unknowingly maybe was kind of predicting what counterterrorism is. We can have all the SAM sites in the world. We can have Reagan's SDI. Only one needs to get through. And then when one gets through, it, the, the public is, is you're not doing your jobs. Why aren't you doing your jobs? It's like what you said, talking to that, that veteran. And you were like, you were like um, after 9-11, you were like, it, you know, it wasn't a surprise. Like, and it'll happen again. He was like, what do you mean? And you're like, it's, I mean, it's almost a wonder that it doesn't happen more often. Is, does that, is that equation still, would you say it's still applicable? Because, I mean, it, intelligence agencies, they can't, they can thwart all of the attacks or plans or conspiracies, but at the same time, they don't publicize the fact that they thwarted them because then that could compromise their ability to get information, their tactics. So it's like, they don't come on the news and it's, hey, uh, a guy was going to dump VX gas in Hartsfield Jackson Airport. I guess they wave to the NSA now. They picked that up. But they're doing that. They, they can't go on and say that, right? So instead, it's just, you know, I lived in Atlanta for 15 years and I'm just going to Hartsfield Jackson. I don't think anything of it. And little do I know, there's a Fred Burton there and another guy like, I cannot believe we just pulled that off. But it's, we can't tell anyone because that could, that could undermine our ability to thwart the next one. So someone like me or my listeners, like we're not in the dark world. We don't know about everything that's been thwarted. Would you say that that equation is still pertinent, that it's 100% of the time versus a non-0% of the time? I do. I think there, there are unrealistic expectations on the part of all of us, mm-hmm. citizens, the news media, politicians, that... Uh, we are going to have a 100% success rate of thwarting all these attacks. And the the facts are that we're not. And you're going to have your Boston bombings, your San Bernardino kinds of attacks, just simply because the the FBI, whose primary mission is to thwart domestic acts of terrorism, uh, have, you know, and they've done a great job since 9-11, but for the most part, uh, if you look at some of the successful operations, these individuals have slipped through the cracks and the system is not 100%. Now, in fairness to the Bureau, they have done a wonderful job. In fairness to even organizations that, that are much maligned at times, like TSA, they have done a great job since 9-11 at just keeping planes safe from flying every day. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, the community, I think, does a a great job of thwarting plots. The the challenge, Tommy, is, and it's always been one of these uh, Sirhan Sirhan kind of issues where uh, if you or I are planning some sort of an attack and you and I are discussing this uh, in 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 the dark web or, or in a chat room, there's a high probability that we're going to get identified, picked off. One of us is going to get cold feet and roll over on each other. But that singleton, that, that, that person that's just out there, kind of like what we experienced um, with the Miramal Kanzi case, the Kanzi case, he was the shooter at the front gate of the CIA Mm -hmm. uh, many years ago, the Sirhan Sirhan, the John Hinckley kind of person that doesn't tell anybody about their plans and they just methodically and very quietly go about their business and putting together some sort of operation. Now, in fairness to those kinds of persons, usually their operations are very containable, meaning Mm -hmm. don't get me wrong. It's horrific for the target set, but usually a, a single person with that kind of mission usually gets thwarted or neutralized fairly quickly. So those are the challenges today in the intelligence community is, is finding like the Timothy McVeigh who drove the truck into the, into the federal building in Oklahoma city or, or finding the next Sirhan Sirhan who shot RFK. Those are the real tough, tough tasks that uh, the intelligence community, you know, uh, is, is always on point for. Yeah. Right. And then there's the, and then there's that, that, that devilish seesaw pendulum of when nine eleven does happen, 
Where's the CIA? How come they didn't catch this? A couple of years go by and we're doing extraordinary renditions and we got some black sites and some Lear jets that maybe or maybe don't pick up some guys and bring them to Guantanamo or Turkey or somewhere. And then you get a couple of years of that and then all of a sudden you have a bunch of uh, moral high horse uh, snobs like myself at 18. What are they doing? Don't they understand that this isn't how humanity should be? And then you get a Mandalay Bay shooting, you get 59 dead and 500 plus injured. And it's, you know, beat the pot and some pans. And it's, what are we even paying the, these intelligence agencies to do? And it's kind of, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. Because if you stop it, first of all, you can't even stop 100% of them. But the ones that do get through, it's, what are you guys doing? And it's, throw them the funding, give them more. You know, everything gets funded. You want this, we're going to do it. And then a couple of years goes by, and critiquing the exact things that we just gave you were now like, you guys are tyrants, you're fascists. And it's like, you know, it sucks to suck. Like there's, you know, there's no way around that. And it's, it's, it's the safety and liberty trade off, right? It's, you, you can't, you can't stop a hundred percent of them. How do you stop that lone wolf? Well, you would probably need to be able to use a supercomputer or some hypercomputer and, and take in every bit of information, every book he had on Amazon, every Google search he had, every post he liked on Reddit in 2011 to use all of that, put it together and create a profile and then use like a probability algorithm to say he's probably going to commit a crime. God forbid someone finds out about that program and they're going to be like, oh, so now they're charging us for pre-crime. And it's almost like, it's almost like an emotionally abusive spouse. Like you guys can't win. And it's kind of shitty, excuse my French, but it's, you know, it kind of seems like that. Yeah. I, I, I think uh, when you're looking at these kinds of challenges today, I, you know, the older I get, I, I tend to um, think that as I look back at, at some of these um, process and procedures that we have in place is that the, the oversight today is so far greater than the oversight we had on my watch. Yeah. And I can remember even the old timers when I first joined talking about the oversight that we had. And so I, I think, again, that's where the American public at times is misinformed at the degree of uh, just scrutiny that's placed upon uh, investigative agencies in general, especially in a very political uh, kind of environment like we've all lived through and continue to live through. Yeah. And, and then, uh, you know, the, the average FBI agent or, or HSI agent or, or ATF agent that's just trying to do their job, uh, it can be very frustrating because there are so many levels of supervision to get their job done. And so, you know, and there's a reason for it. I mean, I get that as a student of history. I mean, I, I recognize fully the, the scope of overreach that organizations in the intelligence community, the FBI and the CIA have perpetrated for many, many years. Uh, and the reason there's so many oversights and restrictions and headquarters kinds of supervision of certain cases is because of that. Yeah. And, uh, but I can tell you just from a working agent perspective, it, it can be very frustrating at times. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, again, it's sort of the damned if you do, damned if you don't, right? By having these oversights and these restrictions, it's kind of how we keep the three-headed dog beast of totalitarianism at bay, right? You kind of keep it chained down so it can only pull so far one way or the other. But then at the same time, something like 9-11 happens and everyone's, you know, oh, well, it's the compartmentalization. That's what did it. The agencies weren't talking to each other. And it's like, okay, but if you get rid of that compartmentalization, everyone's going to be screaming uh, dictatorship. And it's, I don't know, it kind of, maybe this is the best. Maybe the, where we are now for all of its flaws. I mean, look at every nation in the history of the world. Like maybe where we are is like, maybe that's the best that can be done. And like, it's not half bad. Like it's, yeah, take it well, for what it is. It's good. Well, I think when you look at, and I've, I've seen other systems around the world, good yeah. and bad. And, yeah. 
when you look at uh, the, the sheer geography of our nation and the separation of powers and local sheriffs and local police and federal jurisdiction in certain areas, you know, the system works pretty well here in the United States, you know, certainly is it perfect? By no stretch of the imagination is it perfect. But uh, I think you do have um, a fair amount of checks and balances in place. Now, I know the FBI came very close in losing their um, counterterrorism mandate after 9-11. I mm-hmm. mean, uh, there was some discussions of creating a domestic MI5, similar to what the Brits have. And not allowing them to have arrest authority and, and maybe parsing that out to the United States Marshals to do arrests. You know, there you could have figured it out, but you know, the FBI remained intact for the most part and um and I think has has done a tremendous job since 9-11. And and the the proof is really in the pudding too, Tommy, is that we haven't had a catastrophic attack on US soil since 9-11. Yes, you could argue that Boston sure. the bombing was horrific. Uh, you can argue that San Bernardino was bad and, and some of the other isolated uh, shooting events we've had around the country. But from a c- catastrophic strike on U.S. soil, there hasn't been one. No. So, you know, the, the proof is in the evidence uh, yeah. of, of what they've been capable of doing. Yeah. And um, I've kept you for 42 minutes, so let's... We'll wrap this one up so I can, because I know you got another thing coming up after this. But I was going to say, yeah, it's, you've seen other systems around the world and it's kind of like the Super Bowl champion, right? Doesn't mean that the team's perfect. You could always say they, sh- they could have gone undefeated. They could have allowed zero points. They could have allowed no first down conversions. But ultimately, if like, they're the one that won the Super Bowl, it's like they were the least worse. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't always be improving. But it's, that's how I tend to look at America. I'm like, a lot of problems, yeah a lot of problems and let's go for the gold, but I'm not ready to burn down this system because I think something's wrong. Cause I don't know, man, you look at Soviet Russia, you look at current CCP, you look at cartels dominating South America. And I'm like, you know what? We got some flaws, but like, it's pretty good. Right. It's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. It, it, we, it's still uh, the greatest system in the world. And, and we're very blessed to live in the greatest nation of the world, Tommy. Damn right, sir. And um, very last thing, I was going to say, that was such a badass description when uh, the guy picked you up in the helicopter <laughs> <laughs> over your head. I just, I was like, man, your neighbors must have been, your neighbors probably were thoroughly convinced that you were, that you were a James Bond character. You <laughs> ran out with a suitcase, glasses, earpiece, gun in the holster and get into a helicopter. And it's just like, what the hell's going on? <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> that that was that was a pretty awesome flex but um yeah i have to say i miss those days tommy yeah how can you not how can you not right i mean it's <laughs> how do you not die if you're dialing it up to 11 and you're and you're dropping like intelligence uh, surveillance and cities and stuff and sitting in a plane with mujahideen fighters and yeah how do you not you know it might be kind of hard some days to just make coffee and be like is this but same time you got to do it you got to live a life that most people never will but i'm going to keep talking and not let you go um i'm going to email you i would love to have you on again sir i know you're an author of a lot of books and i love this is the stuff i love and um i say this to everyone this is a one-man show one-man operation i don't have a boss so if i invite someone on it's because i want you on so there's no uh there's no charity here so i i thoroughly enjoy your book and i would love to have you on again i know you said you wrote about benghazi i'll look through the other ones and uh or do you have a recommendation of all your other books? Do you have a recommendation oh to the top one? Well, it really kind of depends on your interest. Uh, after my first book, Ghost, I wrote a, a book called Chasing Shadows about uh, a political assassination in my neighborhood when I was a kid. A lot of folks like that. Uh, then I, the, my Benghazi book mm-hmm. you know, was, was written as a result of um, the, the tragic and horrific events. And sure. I'll tell you a little backstory on that sure. i since i had investigated the last united states ambassador killed in the line of duty in 1988 on pac-1 the plane crash which which crashed in pakistan uh, i really wanted to do a story uh, a book on benghazi and so you had 1988 until ambassador chris stevens was killed in benghazi and then my last book uh, in beirut rules is on the, you know the story of the cia station chief that had been kidnapped and murdered so 
if you like ghosts, you might like Chasing Shadows. If you're interested in Benghazi, I think uh, that story is good. And if you're just interested in, you know, the life of a very good man who died for his country, then my last book is also pretty good too. But uh, I would welcome the opportunity to come back on again. And I, I really appreciate your your interest in, in, in Ghost and my story. And, and thank you for what you do. Yeah, well, well, thanks. Well, so thank you, man. Thank you for coming on. I love it. It's that you give, you gave me 45 minutes of your time. And to me, it's like, I love having these. It's like what my best friend said a year ago before I started this podcast. He said, he's known me since fifth grade. He goes, Tommy, you've been doing podcasts your whole life. You just haven't recorded them. You just <laughs> talk to everyone. And so now I'm like, I would do this even if it wasn't recording. I would be like, oh, hell yeah. I'm about to talk to this guy. So I appreciate it, man. I'm leaning towards Benghazi because I actually don't know a lot about that. I know Cold War is my wheelhouse, but I'm realizing I actually don't know a lot about Benghazi. Well, pick up the uh, paperback because I updated that. And uh, uh, so let me know what you think. Yes, sir. Well, I will send you an email, but let's, uh, let's aim for a January episode or whenever you want. No rush. We don't have to figure that out right now. But um, that would be awesome. I'd love to do a Benghazi episode. Mr. Well, Fred, take- thank you, sir. Thank you, Tommy, and and please have a a very Merry Christmas. You too, sir. Everyone buy it. Ghost, Confessions of a Counterterrorism Agent. It's on Audible. Awesome narrator. Perfect book. Again, I have yet to recommend a bad book. If you think otherwise, I dare you to challenge me. Mr. Burton, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. God bless America, and thank you for what you do, sir. Thank you, Tommy. Take care.